John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, the Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. And we are starting right where we left off with the latest company introduction of Company F. Roll Call of Company F by Corporal Samuel W. Hill The general history and itinerary of the three years' campaigns of the regiment from Antietam to Appomattox, as well as the revised roster in the appendix showing individual records, must be relied upon for fuller particulars of Company F than can be given in this contribution. As originally mustered into the United States service, the organization was composed of 100 boys and men, many being just out of school. This number, by subsequent enlistments, drafts, and finally by transfers from the 62nd Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers, when the term of service of that famous organization expired, was increased to 150 enlisted men. To narrate the deeds sketch the achievements, and write descriptions of all the faithful comrades of Company F would require a volume. Where or how to discriminate, where so many gave up their lives or were wounded or maimed for life, would be a delicate and difficult task to perform. The writer will, therefore, not attempt it. In mentioning names of comrades, it will be simply suggestive of prevailing types of patriots. The career of James Calort, the first captain of the company, affords a fine illustration of the truth of the above. The public-spirited citizens of Pittsburgh, who, in the August 1862, promoted the company, and who advertised for recruits, to give standing to the company as well as to reward a worthy soldier, then arranged that Sergeant James Calort, of Company A, of the 9th Pennsylvania Reserve Corps, then in active service, should be made the first captain. Sergeant Calord refused to accept a furlough to leave his company in the field in the presence of the enemy to accept the captaincy of Company F until after the impending Second Battle of Bull Run. In that action, he was seriously wounded, and although chosen captain of Company F, he was never able to serve. For his patriotic action in declining the furlough, and also for his bravery in that battle, Governor Curtin commissioned Sergeant Collard, Lieutenant Colonel of the 155th Regiment. Unfortunately, his disability continuing, although duly mustered into the service with that rank, he was never able to join the regiment, and in January 1863, resigned the office. Captain John Markle of West Newton, who had recruited 20 sturdy farmer boys from Westmoreland County, was commissioned first captain of the company. He proved himself a brave and efficient officer, his efforts contributing much to the excellent discipline and drill which Company F soon acquired. Edward E. Clapp was commissioned first lieutenant, and Henry A. Breed, second lieutenant. Both these officers were well-known businessmen of Pittsburgh, having abandoned their business to take up arms for the Union cause. Their patriotic example and moral deportment were most beneficial in the formative days of the company, and in the battles and campaigns following, they proved ideal soldiers. Dr. William H. King, a practicing dentist of Monongahela City, who was the senior of most members of the company, became the first orderly sergeant, and materially assisted in molding the raw material under his command into the well-drilled and disciplined soldiers. Accompanying Sergeant King to join the company, where William P. Ketchum, a young farmer, who became a messmate of Sergeant King, Thomas L. Fife, David Allen, Alan Wall, Joseph Taylor, 
and William H. DeWalt, of the Company A, all from the Monongahela Valley, and all proved brave and faithful soldiers. The company seemed to have specially attracted a delegation of city boys, still in their teens, being principally from Bayardstown, then part of the 5th and Ninth Wards. This squad of boys was composed of George P. McClelland, George Bradley, William B. Glass, John H. Ralston, John Mackin, William J. Adams, Thomas H. Dixon, Charles Bardeen, Robert A. Hill, William J. Hill, S. W. Hill, Ellis C. Thorne, Frank F. Martin, Marion Martin, Theodore Baldwin, William Clotworthy, and Harry M. Curry, who was the youngest of all, being but fifteen years old. This squad became the life and spirit of the company in camp and bivouac. From its ranks were furnished several excellent singers for the Regimental Glee Club, which was wont to relieve the monotony of a soldier's life in winter quarters. Alec Stevenson, Hodden Marshall, who became drum major, Sergeant William Winkle, Billy Devine, John K. Dazell, and James A. McDowell were not much behind the loony squad in fun-loving mischief or in fighting qualities. Early in the career of the company, John H. Ralston was appointed quartermaster sergeant and William B. Glass was promoted to commissary sergeant, Ellis C. Thorne securing the appointment as hospital steward. The company was fortunate in securing these important details. It made Company F solid for clothing, having Ralston as quartermaster sergeant, and in the matter of rations, with William B. Glass as commissary sergeant. It was equally fortunate. The detail of Ellis C. Thorne over the quinine and commissary and medical stores also provided for Company F's wants in that direction. James A. McDowell and John McConnell are recalled as among the recruits from Elizabeth who are in deserved promotion to sergeants for faithful duty in every battle. The former, while serving as orderly sergeant, was captured in action at Five Forks, but after some hours in captivity, escaped in time to share the final honors of the victory at Appomattox. These men all made good. The hilarity of the loony crowd, as the Bairdstown squad dubbed themselves, was infectious. Who can forget the cheerful singing of Fare You Well, My Mary Ann, rendered by Billy Adams? Poor fellow. He never flagged in any march or battle until he gave up his good right arm in the charge of June 18th in front of Petersburg. The men of Company F were patriots and heroes, and well might they be proud of each other. Incidents Recalled Of the original enrollment, indeed all became sick in the first few months from exposure, hard marching, and the repulse of food and infamous cooking. The great majority, however, recovered and went through the 32 battles and skirmishes that fell to the lot of the 155th Regiment. Every man in Company F got his bullet scar. Strange to remark, except Corporal James J. Carroll, who never missed a march or battle, though he frequently had his clothing cut by Confederate bullets. At Bethesda Church, Corporal Carroll and Alex Stevenson had the good fortune, while on the advanced skirmish line in a peach orchard, to come across some gold and silver buried in the orchard. The military superiors were too busy with the strategy of active war to make inquiries about this find. A detachment of recruits joined the company in winter quarters just before the wilderness campaign. The celerity with which its members acquired their military education was remarkable. They soon became the equals on battlefields with the veterans of the company. Inspection of the roster shows that these new comrades shed their blood for their country freely and faltered not in times of danger. Captain John Markle led the company on the Antietam campaign and in the Battle of Fredericksburg, exhibiting remarkable coolness and bravery in the great charge on Mary's Heights. Lieutenant Clapp was seriously wounded in the same action at the head of the company. Captain Markle, delicate in physique, soon succumbed to the privations and exposures, his complaints becoming worse. He resigned and returned home in the spring of 1863, continuing a constant sufferer until his death. Lieutenant Edward E. Clapp recovered from his wound and became captain. He was a model officer, a Christian gentleman, who cared for the men of his company. 
He was killed leading his men in battle at Laurel Hill near Spotsylvania Courthouse, Virginia, May 8, 1864. His body was buried on the battlefield, side by side with that of Captain Charles C. Johnston of Company A, who also gave his life in the same battle. Lieutenant Henry A. Breed served faithfully and bravely in the campaigns and battles of Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg. His health was delicate, but in the exposure and forced marches of the campaigns mentioned, he manfully endured the same until he was discharged for disability. Sergeant George P. McClelland succeeded Lieutenant Breed as second lieutenant. He was promoted to first lieutenant and later to captain on the death of Captain Clapp. Captain McClelland was wounded in the heel at the Battle of North Anna River. Of not over-robust physique, by grim determination, Captain McClelland met every demand for military duty in camp, or battle, without flinching. He soon recovered from his first wound, and returned to duty in time to lead his company in the great charge of June 18th on the Confederate fortifications and in the battles around Petersburg. At Five Forks, April 1st, 1865, Captain McClelland was shot down, receiving what was deemed a mortal wound, and for half an hour was a prisoner in the lines of the Confederates. He was rescued by the triumphant countercharge of the 155th Regiment, as led by Major Klein. They rallied and recaptured the enemy's position. Captain McClelland was carried from the field to the hospital established in the White Oak Church. A detail of eight men of his company promptly volunteered to carry him to the terminal of the Petersburg Military Railroad at Humphrey Station, 11 miles distant. They were denied that privilege. However, the surgeon in charge saying, quote, What is the use? The captain's wound is fatal. Unquote. Then information came that, owing to the advance of the 2nd and the 6th Corps, the railroad had been abandoned, and that the woods were full of Confederate stragglers. The captain was made as comfortable as possible on a feather bed in the church and under orders to move, his comrades tenderly said farewell to him, he being so very weak and exhausted as to be scarcely able to respond. His men proceeded to rejoin the company at Sutherland Station. Later in the afternoon, his company was astonished to find the 5th Corps ambulance train rejoin the column. Captain McClelland was in one of the ambulances, and his company again bade him a hasty goodbye. The regiment, under orders, then started with Sheridan's cavalry on a forced march to intercept Lee's retreating army. Two weeks afterward, on the return march from Appomattox Courthouse, the company found that Captain McClelland had been removed to the Corps Hospital in Petersburg, where, although suffering and very weak, he was being tenderly nursed by his sister, who had come from Pittsburgh for that purpose. It was not until the following August that the captain improved sufficiently to be able to be removed to Pittsburgh. He suffered a relapse, and an operation was performed to remove the decayed splinters of bone from his shoulder, compelling him for two years following to be confined to his room. After the war, he gradually improved and moved to Davenport, Iowa, where he became prominent in business. He was never free from pain, however, and suffered numerous relapses, in one of which he died in 1902. Sergeant William S. Annawalt, after gallant service in the Battle of Fredericksburg, was suddenly stricken with typhoid malarial fever and died in a few days. He was a real Christian and much devoted to his Methodist church. Corporal George Bradley, while leading the charge at Mary's Heights, December 13, 1862, received a severe wound, disabling him from further military duty. He was carried off the battlefield under a heavy fire of the enemy, by Sergeant Samuel Walker, who at Chancellorsville was destined to receive most serious wounds. Walker suffered the amputation of a leg, and was finally transferred to the United States Veteran Reserve Corps as a commissioned officer. He served out his term, and died a few years ago, in Butler, Pennsylvania. Sergeant Frank M. Martin was an unusually efficient and brave soldier. He was killed in battle May 8, 1864, at Laurel Hill. How his comrades pitied and loved his stricken brother, Marion Martin and the company, who completed his term of service without his brother's comradeship. He, too, was a brave soldier, and was mustered out with the company June 6, 1865. Private Robert A. Hill, who was accidentally shot by a comrade on the march to Antietam, and as a result had his leg amputated, 
was the first man of Company F to be wounded. His brother, William J. Hill, overcome by the exposure and hardships, drooped and died of fever at camp near Falmouth, Virginia, soon after the Battle of Fredericksburg, in which he had participated with credit. Lieutenant William H. King, M.D., familiar called Doc, after years of faithful service as sergeant, was promoted and came home in command of the company as first lieutenant. At Five Forks he took command of the company when Captain McClellan fell early in the action and handled it well throughout the remainder of that severe action. Although older in years than most of the men of the company, he never flagged in the performance of any duty and was present in every battle. He was a brave, honorable gentleman and soldier, and probably one of the best educated men in the regiment. Private William P. Ketchum served continuously in the ranks taking part in every battle until in July 1864 he had, at the Battle of Laurel Hill, May 8th, the distinction of being the last to speak to the lamented Captain Clapp a few minutes before his death, in taking his canteen to fill with water. Later, he was detailed from fatigue duty in the trenches in the Siege of Petersburg to serve with Captain George M. Loglin, Commissary of Musters of the Fifth Corps. Bradford Allen and Allen Wall both served on a detached duty with Sergeant George Booth of Company D and the United States Signal Corps. Among the other many faithful soldiers of Company F were William Adams, Adam Darr, William M. Birch, C. Cunningham, Billy Devine, John Jameson, and David Garris. All these could be relied upon as being as prompt in every battle as in responding to calls for rations. David Allen, now an honored citizen of Nebraska, and for years a justice of the peace and active in the good work of the GAR, received his badge of honor by wounds received at the recapture of Fort Stedman, May 25, 1865. The itinerary and rosters must be referred to for the names and deeds of the many patriots of Company F not specially named in this sketch. The sad fate of Color Corporal Charles Bardeen, mortally wounded while defending the colors, and who died in the hospital and was later buried in an unknown grave, is especially pathetic. Color Corporal John Mackin, wounded defending the flag at Gettysburg, and later fatally wounded in the wilderness, was a sad experience. The story of Sergeant Ashbury Seacrest's death at Five Forks, in a death conflict with a Confederate foe, both being found feet to feet with empty guns, are perpetuated in the itinerary and on the roll of honor of Company F. In the matter of foraging, when necessary, Company F was always able to compete with any other company in the service. They knew just what to do, and just how to do it. Record Enrollment Casualties, etc. of Company F Killed and died of wounds. Captain Edward E. Clapp, killed at Laurel Hill, Virginia, May 8, 1864. Sergeant Frank Martin, killed at Laurel Hill, Virginia, May 8, 1864. Sergeant Ashbury W. Seacrest, killed at Five Forks, Virginia, May 1, 1865. Color Corporal Charles Bardeen, killed at Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862. Color Corporal John H. Mackin, Died of wounds received in Wilderness, Virginia, May 5, 1864. Corporal William McCabe, killed at Petersburg, Virginia, June 18, 1864. Corporal George R. Markle, died of wounds received at Five Forks, Virginia, May 1, 1865. Private Theodore Baldwin, killed at North Anna River, May 23, 1864. Private William Hulsinger, killed at Petersburg, Virginia, June 18, 1864. Private Jacob Kennedy, Died of wounds received at Hatcher's Run, Virginia, March 25, 1865. Private Samuel Mays. Died of wounds received at White Oak Road, Virginia, May 30, 1865. Private George Willie. Killed at Hatcher's Run, Virginia, March 25, 1865. Missing in Action. Private Haram Millerin at Spotsylvania, Virginia, May 12, 1864. Died of Disease Sergeant William Annawalt Died January 3, 1863 Private David Burkhart Died at City Point, Virginia, January 6, 1865 Private John Cope Died January 4, 1863 Private Samuel Carnahan Died September 4, 1864 Private Bryce Easton 
died near Sharpsburg, Maryland, October 3, 1862. Private William Fullerton, died January 12, 1863. Private Sansom Hugh, died November 3, 1862. Private William J. Hill, died November 2, 1863. Private Hugh McCord, died December 24, 1862. Private James L. Snodgrass, died November 16, 1862. Private Henry West, died at Alexander, Virginia, December 9, 1862. Wounded in Action Captain George P. McClelland, Five Forks, Virginia, May 1, 1865 Sergeant Henry M. Curry, Five Forks, Virginia, May 1, 1865 Sergeant Samuel Walker, Chancellorsville, Virginia, May 3, 1863 Corporal Samuel W. Hill, Laurel Hill, Virginia, May 8, 1864 Corporal George Bradley, Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862 Corporal Thomas R. Fife, Wilderness, Virginia, May 5, 1864 Private William Adams, Petersburg, Virginia, June 18, 1864 Private David Allen, Hatcher's Run, Virginia, May 25, 1865 Private Amelia Boilu, Dabney's Mills, Virginia, February 6, 1865 Private William Clotworthy, Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862 Private Adam Dar, Chancellorsville, Virginia, May 3, 1863 Private Joseph Huver, Spotsylvania, Virginia, May 12, 1864 Private Peter Hansen, Cold Harbor, Virginia, May 3, 1864 Private Gershom B. Horner, Fredericksburg, Virginia, May 13, 1862 Private Jacob Landsberger, Wilderness, Virginia, May 5, 1864 Private Henry Lepper, Spotsylvania, Virginia, May 12, 1864 Private John M. Miller, Wilderness, Virginia, May 5, 1864 Private James Moore, Cold Harbor, Virginia, May 3, 1864 Private William James McKeever, Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862 Private George Reddick, Petersburg, Virginia, June 18, 1864 Private Henry Roig, Wilderness, Virginia, May 5, 1864 Private John Sample, Dabney's Mills, Virginia, February 6, 1865 Private James Shaner, Five Forks, Virginia, May 1, 1865 Private Sebastian Smith, Spotsylvania, Virginia, May 12, 1864 Private Joseph Taylor, Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862 Recapitulation Total Enrollment, 159 Killed and died of wounds, 13 Died of disease, 11 Discharged on account of wounds and disabilities, 49 Transferred to Veteran Reserve Corps, 14 Transferred to other organizations, 27 Deserted, 6 Dishonorably discharged, 1 Not on muster-out rolls, 3 Discharged by general orders and habeas corpus, 3 Mustered out with regiment, 32 Wounded in action, 26 one special note, that Private William James McKeever, wounded at Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 13, 1862, re-enlisted in Company B, 7th U.S. Infantry, and was wounded and promoted to sergeant. And that wraps up this week's company sketch. On my website, rebellionstories.com, for this company post, I'll include all of the pictures and photos from this company sketch, all of the boys and officers that served in it that were included in the regimental history, so come check it out, along with the song that was mentioned, Fare Thee Well, My Mary Ann. If you haven't heard it before, it'll be posted right on the website, so you can click on it, or you could just YouTube it yourself if you like, but I like to put it all in one spot for you. And I hope you guys are really enjoying these company sketches as much as I am. I know I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about them, but mainly that's because I just want the writer themselves to be giving that individual, here's all the people that I served alongside, and let them do the writing. But for anyone else that's just catching up that doesn't know, thank you for listening. It means a lot to me. Your emails, your comments, your messages, it all means a lot. 
and it keeps me going and it, you know, it just, it makes it so much fun to come in and always just pick up another book, do more research, keep looking and searching. And it's a lot to move forward with. So I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you for your support on my PayPal, my Patreon, my Facebook, my merch store, my website, my Twitter. It all means a lot that everyone is engaging and supporting me. So I just wanted to take some time to talk about that. Thank you. It means a lot to me. All right. So with that out of the way, you can go to rebellionstories.com. You can see everything that's going to be posted for this episode, along with the song that was mentioned, which is, I found quite entertaining to listen to. Uh, very soft version. I'm sure they didn't probably sing it as soft as the version that I'm going to post, but it's very nice. With that, my friends, thank you for stopping by for your weekly Civil War podcast and reading this regimental history. We are certainly working our way through it. So, And of course, the next episode that we'll be doing next week will be Company G. So we have that to look forward to. With that, have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Old John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Hallelujah, for his soul is marching on. John Brown was a hero, undaunted, true, and brave. And Kansas knew his valor when he fought her rights to save. And now, though the grass grows green above his grave, his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. He captured Harper's Ferry with us 19 men so few And frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and through They hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitorous crew But a soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah John the Baptist of the Christ we are to see Christ who of the bondmen shall the liberator be And soon throughout the sunny south the slaves shall all be free For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah That he heralded, he looked from heaven to view On the army of the Union With its flag red, white, and blue And heaven shall sing with anthems Or the deed they mean to do For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah
martyrs of freedom Then strike while strike ye may The death blow of oppression In a better time and way The dawn of old John Brown Has brightened in the day And his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Soul 